and it's and I'm trying to make it kind of like more fun and playful where I'm just kind of looking for targets to jump to kind of like if I'm outside playing with my kids I'm like oh there's a tree overhead I'm going to try to jump to that leaf I'm going to try to jump to that leaf I'm going to try and get it with my left hand I'm going to try and get my right hand try to get one straight above me try to get one that's further away Welcome to the Movement Code Podcast, where we help you decode movement, health, and lifestyle so that you can expand and grow. Hey guys, my name is Antonio Gurley, your host for the Movement Code Podcast. I am a father, husband, business owner, rehab practitioner, and coach. Information overload has paralyzed many of us, and we are overwhelmed with good intentions and don't know what or who to trust. We aim to provide you clarity and confidence by bringing you expert advice for the everyday person. Thanks for spending some time with me today and enjoy the episode. All right, guys, welcome to episode three of the Movement Code Podcast. Today in, uh, today on the podcast, we have Todd Hargrove. I'm very excited about this episode, and it was a blast because I Todd has been so influential on my approach to movement with my clients and my patients. So it was, it, it was a lot of fun for me, just in, in particular, asking a lot of these questions that I've been thinking about over the years. But more importantly, he has some really great insight that I know all of you will find very useful because movement is such an important part of our body. And that's really what Todd's message is about, is how we can play with movement a little bit more so that we can better understand our body's abilities. For those of you who have not checked out our website yet, you can find us at enhancedmovements.com. If you go to that homepage there, we do have some free offers for you guys where we have a couple of our free PDF guides, mobility related, shoulder related, and low back related. They, they're, they're very helpful if you're dealing with any of those. All you have to do is just subscribe to our newsletter and those PDFs will automatically download into your inbox. They've helped so many of our patients already. This is, this is information that we're given directly from our patients and I know they'll help you guys out as well. But for those of you who are not nearby and want to kind of work with us and get some of, that, some of that information, this would be a perfect opportunity to do so. So thanks for tuning in guys and enjoy the episode. All right, great. Well, uh, welcome, guys. Today on our episode, we have Todd Hargrove. He is an author, a coach, a teacher, and a, uh, a manual movement therapist. So welcome, Todd, to the show, and we're super stoked to have you here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, um, before, I wanted to get this out just so um, you know, anyone who's listening, they know where to find you right off the bat. Where can people connect with you, and where can they learn more about you? I've got a blog at bettermovement.org. If you're on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter, uh, just my name, Todd Hargrove. And then I've got a Facebook page called Better Movement, uh, where I post some things from time to time, but mostly through the blog. Great. That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, I, so we, as mentioned, you are an author. You do have a couple books. Best place to purchase those books for those interested? Uh, Amazon, and you can find information about the books on on the blog as well, and then links to Amazon. Perfect. Awesome. Love it. Uh, so today, uh, I guess I should know the blog, uh, sorry, the books that Todd have, uh, has, um, uh, has written aside from the blogs that he has is we have a guide to better movements. And then most recently we have playing with movement. Is that correct? Yeah. Awesome. So as you can tell in the title, today's discussion is going to be talking about movement. Um, as I was talking with Todd before the show is a lot of his material from the blog and not only the books has really shaped how I practice and I view movement as a clinician and a coach myself. Our, our business name is called Enhanced Movements. This is the Movement Code Podcast. So we share a very similar, uh, I guess, uh, love for movement. So with that being said, what's your background with movement and how has it shaped your current thought process and approach to movement? Yeah, well, I, I grew up playing some sports. I grew up playing tennis, uh, you know, in the, in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, I, I remember, uh, when I was a teenager going to the U S open and seeing the professionals play. And what struck me was, uh, how, elegant and smooth and efficient they were in their movement almost in a way that looks kind of weird or unusual 
I mean, if you if you've ever uh, seen professional athletes up close and in person doing what they do, I think it gives you more of an appreciation for how good they are at what they're doing compared to just seeing it on TV, which, which is pretty amazing. But but that kind of got me thinking about, you know, how do they do that? I know, I know that they're hitting the ball really hard and they're moving really fast but they're just so smooth and they're making it look easy. That's what I think got me was they're, they're making a hard thing look easy and almost effortless. So that was kind of one thing that got me, got me interested. And then uh, when I got a little bit older, I used to be an attorney. Uh, I got more interested in the body and how it works when I was having a lot of chronic pain when I was, when I was an attorney. Uh, so that got me kind of really motivated to, to start feeling better. And, uh, Around the early 2000s, I don't know if you, if you remember this, there started to be some books coming out by Gray Cook and Mike Boyle that were talking about kind of like functional training and how the body works and how it can be coordinated better. And kind of I think the message for me was we can try to understand, um, you know, how people become more coordinated, try to become more coordinated. And if you can move better and like perform better at sports, there's some connection there to feeling better in your body as well. So at the time I was still playing sports and, and interested in sports. Um, and I, I really like this idea that you could see uh, that you could kind of like systematically uh, try to get better at sports and that would make you healthier as well. So that's kind of my interest in, in movement and coordination and movement patterns, like efficient ways to move. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what, so I think that's what, I love about movement and find it so interesting is I think sometimes we try to compartmentalize and segment things out almost to a fault where we, we feel like we have to be able to accomplish something or do something in order before we can do something else. Like in order for me to move, I actually have to be out of pain. So we sit and wait for that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I remember. I, I, it reminds me, like when I was going back to that tennis story. When I was young and wondering how do you get good at that, well, there was the idea that you practiced. Maybe there was the idea that you lift some weights or that you're just born with the right genes. Uh, but now we have this kind of like more better understanding about how how all this stuff is related. And there's there's kind of more ways to go about your training than just getting in the gym and lifting weights. You can kind of think about the quality of the way that you're moving. Yeah, and I think now more than ever, especially with the with COVID nineteen and the stay at home orders, a lot of people were scrambling because they didn't have the gym, they didn't have the tools that they were so accustomed to using before, and they were forced now um, to use body weight and to get a lot more creative. Yeah, yeah, I kind of I've I've been doing the, noticing the same thing. Actually, I've got a pretty good gym in the basement, but uh, I guess maybe just with the spirit of the times, I'm kind of looking much more into body weight styles of training myself and kind of getting back to some just kind of natural movements that anyone can do anywhere, you know, like you're running, jumping, uh, moving around on the ground, rolling around on the ground, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's awesome. And that kind of segments me to um, uh, the next question is, what do you think we're missing as, as a society when it comes to movement? Is it a pure lack of interest and more of an exploration type of uh, maybe focus? Is it a just general lack of movement literacy or understanding? Or perhaps are we incorporating too many rules around movement? Yeah, I think all those are good, good ways of looking at it. I look at it as, uh, you know, you're living in, in a modern world. Uh, where movement is kind of discouraged. I mean, everyone has a natural interest in, um, you know, going out there and making money and making friends and exploring interesting topics. And most of those things happen uh, through staring into a computer screen or sitting still, like in a more natural environment, like the way we evolved, if you wanted to get those things done, if you wanted to get food and make friends and be part of a tribe, you're out moving all the time. So it's not even really a question about whether those things are going to happen. So my idea is that the environment has an incredible influence uh, on the way you move. And that's both the social environment and the, and the physical environment. So if you're living in an area where there's not good sidewalks or attractive places to run, you're going to do less of that. You're going to get in your car. You're going to sit in front of the computer screen. And the same thing with your, with your community of people that you're friends with. If you happen to be friends with a lot of people that are like, let's go out and play soccer, let's do CrossFit, mm -hmm. let's do yoga, whatever, 
uh, you're going to kind of move with that social groove and tend to do the things that uh, other people are doing because every, we're all totally social creatures. So I think that um, kind of being aware of the way your physical environment and your community affects your movement is, to me, that's kind of what's, what's wrong. That's why a lot of people are sitting still instead of moving. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And like we were just saying, especially with the whole COVID thing is you look at other communities. I mean, I'm in Colorado and I'm literally looking out my window right now and I see a trail. Like we, we, we have the Cold Creek right trail. Right there. Are you in Boulder? Oh, I'm, I'm right outside of Boulder. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can see the, I can turn this around and you can see the flat iron. So I spent I'm not, some time there. I remember being able to walk uh, into the mountains right from where I was. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a little further out. We're in technically in Lockton in Louisville, but it's, it's literally a, a five minute drive in. Um, right. But you know, you look at, you look at New York city right now where you have these obviously strict and more stringent regions or rules, but even then we you can't it's just not accessible to be able to go out and do certain things but this this does remind me and I'm, I'm i'm hoping this is the 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 quote that i was looking for out of your out of your book um a guide to better movement chapter two you start out with a quote much more of the brain is devoted to movement than language language is only a little thing sitting on top of this huge ocean of movement and more recently um on uh, Dr. Liebenson's webinar series through all of this for First Principles of Movement, he had Nick Wickelman on there talking about how movement above all else is what our body associates with. So even though we, even though we talk, we use language and no matter what language it is, there's usually some sort of associated movement that our brain recognizes instantaneously in hearing that. And I find that super fascinating because in a digital world where most of our communication is now, you know, uh, through through digital, whether it's you know audio or whatever that is, there is a lack of movement in in, in that, and and even just expression, facial expressions, and recognizing those things, it's kind of hard to pick up on all those things. Yeah, yeah, you become it's a very disembodied kind of a way to live your life <laughs> is is just to is just to always be up here without without moving around as much and uh i think that a lot of people um are kind of they're feeling that lack you know one way or the other of like getting embodied and getting into their body and doing all this stuff that's really natural for us to do um and some kind of people kind of have this realization and this calling that wow, it would be really interesting to get a lot more in, in tune with my body I, I i've got the clients that come in like you probably have that are really computer people and they're living in an incredibly interesting world online in this kind of abstract world and then and then it's a small percentage of those people are like you know what i would kind of like to explore my physical body as well and what it can do with movement that would be an interesting journey to go on. Now, not everyone has that interest or that curiosity, but I try. But if it's there, I try to magnify it and let them know that that is a worthwhile, interesting journey to go on through yoga or CrossFit or all these different ways or dance or ways you could go about it. You know? Yeah, that's that's awesome. I agree. Now, with that being said, uh, if you're down, let's talk a little bit about mapping. How does poor mapping lead to either further dysfunction, maybe even pain or something uh, such as decreased blood flow, as you mentioned in your book? Yeah, so uh, this, this is kind of a complicated idea. So that we there's um, the, the idea of uh, proprioception. That's basically your internal sense of where everything is in the body and what it's doing. So if you close your eyes and you move your hand around, you, you know where your finger is, even though you can't see it because of proprioception, because of body awareness. You've got um, sensors all over your body that are always firing and sending information to the brain uh, about, you know, this muscle is stretching or that joint is moving. A tremendous amount of information is always flowing to the brain. So the brain's got this huge job in processing all that information and figuring out where everything is in the body. Is it safe? How's it reacting to the environment? Are we accomplishing whatever physical task we're trying to accomplish? And the parts of the brain that do a lot of that work, you can call them maps. It's like they're metaphorically forming maps of the mm -hmm. body. So the quality of our movement, our um, coordination depends on how well we're mapping things. So if you see a really coordinated person, if you see like a gymnast doing a backflip onto the beam and they don't kill themselves, you know they've got really good body awareness, kinesthesia. 
uh, that's something that develops and grows the more you practice and the, and the more you move. Now, what, one interesting thing we find out with chronic pain is that people with a lot of chronic pain tend to lack good awareness in some of the places that hurt. So part of that is probably the pain is probably causing some of that lack of awareness. So we find out that people with uh, chronic back pain, if you ask them to draw an outline of their back, like where it is and when it's not, they have like a fuzzier image of those areas than other people. If you close your eyes, and you, you might have done this in a yoga class or, or some other kind of mindful movement class, if you close your eyes and just kind of imagine all of the different body parts and try to form like a mental image of how clear they are, you'll find that some are kind of, you can form a really clear image and others feel kind of fuzzy. So, so one of the goals, kind of long story short, one of the goals of a movement practice is to develop better body awareness for better coordination and function, maybe even feeling better in your body as well. Yeah, no, I, I find that to be uh, so useful too. And I think what's, what's really interesting and, and part of the conversation we try to have with our clients and our patients coming in is oftentimes we're trying to walk through the narrative of the story of their chronic pain, right? Cause they've seen maybe just a handful of practitioners or a lot of different practitioners and they're commonly told, Oh, I have, uh, 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 this is what's causing my pain, or I have lack of firing issues, or I have a lack of proprioception, and that's why I have pain, where I think reversing that and talking about how the pain started, and now you have this fuzzy feeling or this fuzzy sense of your spatial awareness, uh, cortical smudging, and all those things that we talk about, and, and that in turn creates this like negative feedback loop, and that's a perfect opportunity for us to help you jump out of that by improving your your mapping capability through proprioceptive awareness, body spatial awareness, whatever that is, mindful moving, we can get you out of that negative feedback loop and start improving the chronic pain that you're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I think what one of the things that I learned the more I studied pain and, and what I'd like my clients to appreciate more is just the complexity of pain. I mean, most people come in and they and they say it hurts here and they really their idea is that there's something wrong in that exact location. And what, mm -hmm. what we've learned is that pain is complex. It depends not just on the condition of your body, but on the way that your nervous system and the brain is perceiving what's going on in there. And that's something that can change, maybe change kind of quickly. And so the way to make pain better is not just to get that body part healed and take the stress off that area, but to just kind of recalibrate how you're, coordinating that area, how you're perceiving that area. And I think what it means is that there's a there's kind of a wide range of things that might help you feel better. Most people come in and they're thinking there's just one thing that I need. I, I need to fix that one area, but, it, yeah. but there's lots of things they can do. Yeah, no, it's, and, and this kind of, uh, I'm jumping back through my questions here because earlier on, I wanted to to figure out how to tie in how the the shift towards structural pathology is the main cause of top musculoskeletal complaints such as low back pain or shoulder pain and, and, and trying to figure out how to have those conversations with our clients and patients about how that might not be the case. So for instance, commonly we'll come in with like someone with shoulder pain and it's what are the, what are having the conversation, what are the movements in which triggers your pain and, and it might be push ups. So we go through push up movement and they do a push up you get pain. Then we just walk them through maybe some, some different cues, some different, some different thought processes in which they can change how they move to make it a little bit more intentional. And all of a sudden there's no pain. So we, then we have this conversation. Well, if you had pain with one rep and literally the next rep you did afterwards, you don't have pain. Could we assume that structural pathology is not the sole cause of your pain? Cause you just proved that you're still loading the shoulder, but yet it doesn't hurt. So I find that to be yeah. uh, kind of a cool, a cool way to show them that you maybe don't need an MRI to determine this, or you don't need surgery because you just did it without pain and that yeah. we can continue to go down that path. 
Yeah. And there, I, I've noticed sometimes there's a resistance to that as well. So you, you get that type of result and they go, wait a minute, it, it's there. I know it's there. I can find it. It's, and, and, then, and then they like provoke it and try to poke it with a stick <laughs> to kind of defend that, that same idea. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, and we, we talk about this so much. I was like, humans are weird. We love finding pain. Like the fact that, and I'm guilty of it too. Like when my shoulder's acting up, I keep doing these things and I'm like, why? It just hurts right here. And I'm like, I'm just grinding it yeah. away and just, just irritating it more. I'm like, yeah. Let's try to shift away and find things that, that we do respond better yeah. to. But, but I think the fear they have is that, okay, I haven't really solved the problem. The problem is still there. It's lurking. And I, this is just kind of avoiding it or, or getting around it. But what, what uh, the thing is, if it's, not, uh, if, if it's not bothering you, that's not a problem. <laughs> it's, yeah. normal to have, it's normal to occasionally have some signal in there and have some pain. By the time you're over, over 25, it's normal to have a, a, a little bit of shoulder discomfort maybe when you're doing a push-up. The, the key is figure out how to do that push-up so it's not bothering you, and then you're doing good. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Now with that, I, th- I think what's super interesting and, and perhaps you can share a little bit about your experience with Feldenkrais and different things like that, but using differentiation or dissociation. I use this quite often in my practice because I love getting people to understand how certain parts uh, should and maybe could move independently, but at the same time, how that differentiation of movement will then make them more synergistically tied together when we do need them. So for instance, my, when I'm, uh, and, and, and as a Cairo, which is, which is super interesting, my wife's a Cairo, so I'm super fortunate where I can get adjusted or manipulated if I do feel like I need it. But more times than not, I am on the ground trying to figure out how I can isolate certain areas of my spine or other joints and get them to mobilize on my own. And more times than not, it's me forcing a certain position of my body, whether that be my thoracic spine or something else, and then moving very segmentally a specific spot to try to move that out. And so that does this, that differentiation or dissociation helps me really isolate where I feel the issue to be to make long stand, long, longer standing changes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that's all, all of that really applies all the way throughout your, your spine and rib cage. So your spine, you've got 24 different vertebra. Each one can move a little bit with respect to its neighbor. So if I like turn to look behind me like this, it's going to be kind of an, an easy, smooth movement. If all of those vertebra rotate just a little bit, with respect to their neighbor. Uh, but what we see with people is that, you know, four or five of those vertebra, they're like a block and they're fused together and they're not moving with respect to each other. So if you can kind of find a way to isolate on that area and differentiate that area, you can kind of restore a little movement to there, which is really easy to ignore for a while because you've got so many, you've got a million ways to move these ribs uh, and the spine. There's just a, a gajillion combinations, and most people are only using just a very small percentage of them. So if they go through some some sort of a process to try to recover or like remember all the little subtle possibilities for movement that are there, they'll like add to their movement repertoire. Feldenkrais, they call that curing sensory motor amnesia. You've basically forgotten about some little subtle little movement that you can do. And so you're not using it. It's almost like a, a language you haven't spoken for a while and you've forgotten some of the words. And when you go back to it, they start kind of come flooding back into your brain. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Now, what's interesting, too, is you just you just uh, reminded me of something of how. What, what I think is super interesting, what I, what I find fascinating about movement, too, is how we assume most of us are doing a movement and they're internalizing how it's actually being processed. But as you had mentioned before with our finger and spatial awareness, it really comes down to what is the outcome of the goal? And when chatting with people and I work, I work a lot more with like hit training, CrossFit, people that are doing boot camps and things like that, as the majority of the population seems to kind of be doing is they're having pain, dysfunction or trouble with the movement, but they're, that's because the goal is to say, okay, pick up this weight, put this weight up overhead or whatever that is. So I try to encourage them is change the goal. If the goal changes from not only just picking up the weight and standing up with it or putting it over your head, you have a much clearer defining target to move more appropriately. And with the dissociation, I think that makes it a lot more applicable for them. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we learned in Feldenkrais is if you, what, one of the exercises you do is you do a simple movement like a reach or a roll or a turn or something like that. And then you do this, the same movement, except for you change where you're putting your attention. So instead of my attending to my target, I attend to my attention is on the movement of the ribs or the movement of the scapula. Or instead of my intention being to um, reach one direction is to move in a slightly different direction. So the idea is each time you change your intention or attention when you move, you change the movement a little bit, maybe just in a subtle way, but maybe in a way that it feels smoother or easier or, or pain-free. So these are like subtle differences. Yeah, I, I love that. The, 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 the subtleties and the details, right? Yeah. Uh, now, I would like to jump back to uh, because I, I have been kind of going down this myself, um, reading some of Chris Summers' work and, and just hearing a couple podcasts and interviews he, he's been on. And I am drawing a blank on his name right now, but I think it's just gymnastic bodies. Is I've had a I've had a strong curiosity with gymnastic and calisthenics and body weight training lately. My primary focus in in training modalities so kettlebells, just because it's bang for buck with three little kids. But that being said, I'm I'm loving groundwork and I'm loving yep. calisthenics like ring works and whatnot. What are what are some of your thoughts on body weight training and how can people, especially now that COVID is still going on, how can people utilize body weight training for their advantage? Yeah, I, I, I like uh, ring stuff. I like body weight stuff. You mentioned uh, GMB. I know those guys. I think they've got a great website for anyone who wants to check it out. I think it's I think it's GMB Fitness or something like that. But I think that there are many, many different ways of training that bring you something, something interesting. And, and I think that what's kind of underrated, in, you know, so you compare, you know, what's better body weight, what's better kettlebells, what's better barbells, you know, you can kind of endlessly debate that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can um, definitely figure out okay, this one's got these strengths. This one's got, this This way of training has some weaknesses. There's some gaps there. If you want to be a professional football player, well, you should be doing barbells. If you're not, maybe. So I think you can very objectively talk about the strengths and weaknesses of these different types of training. I think what's underrated and what people don't look into enough is just your personal interest in that thing, because mm -hmm. that's what's going to get you to show up every single day. So what's the best exercise? The best exercise is what you show up for every single day for a long enough time to get the results, which is months, right? Yeah. So my personal thing is I kind of cycle through different types of thing. I don't stay with one thing more than like a month or two. And then I get onto something else. I have a very wide range of curiosities and interests in any kind of training I do. So I'm like, okay, now I'm into kettlebells. I'll do, and now I'm into barbells. Now I'm, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm into the body weight and I do it for a while. And then my interest runs out or maybe I'm starting to develop like a repetitive stress injury from always doing that same thing. And then I shift and then my, my body feels better. My mind feels better. I never become a highly trained athlete for sure, but I'm always uh, showing up and having fun and staying safe. Well, that I, I mean, most of us aren't, going to be highly trained athletes right so for right. for those that are interested and obviously much more devoted towards one thing one thing that does happen are these repetitive strain injuries because of a lack of variety even right. though certain certain avenues and I'm, I'm not picking on cross this is just one that comes to mind it's it's supposed to be constantly varied right but when you look at programming it's yes. really the same movements done over and over again. Thus, why you see the repetitive injuries. So for those that are not as curious as maybe you and I, how can we add more variability and variety to make sure we are hitting and touching other elements and or prevent, prevent, potentially preventing repetitive strain injuries? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends a little bit on what you're doing. I'll, I'll give you an example from running. I noticed that a lot of people that run don't have a lot of variability in, uh, well, let's say the intensity that they run at. People tend to gravitate towards running at kind of a race pace, kind of that mm -hmm. threshold pace, the, the fastest pace they can sustain for a, an extended period of time. And I've read, although I'm not by any means an expert on running, I've read, uh, there's an interesting idea called uh, the 80-20 principle in running. Are you familiar with this idea? This guy, Steven Saylor, looked at the running logs of top aerobic athletes. So these are rowers as well. And what he found 
80 percent of their time is spent in like long slow distance very low intensity they're staying away from that race pace and then they spend a lot of time not a lot of time but some time going as fast as they possibly can so the amateur tends to spend all of their time almost all of their time at this one intensity neglecting spending doing the really high intensity work and doing the really low intensity work and i think that's kind of generally true for a lot of people that, that work out with weights as well they're always doing something that's kind of like medium hard and neglecting the super high intensity and the high volume of low intensity you think that's right Oh yeah, I, I I mean I I'm shaking my head because I'm also guilty of that, but <laughs> I do it I do it myself. I, I I gravitate there, you know. Yeah, I I mean I was literally having this conversation uh, for one of our other episodes, chatting with the gentleman who was talking about breathing, and he was recommending um, for every one day you have intense training, you have four to five days of the moderate loads, right? And Pavel Satsulin talks about this a lot in his kettlebell works and books. Don't get burned it's, out. Yeah, it's like. Because it's it's live to fight another day. And so much of us is we're just go, 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 thinking that we can get more in and that's going to get us results faster. But yet you're each day in and day out, your training becomes suboptimal because you're not recovered or you have the repetitive strain injuries. And then you get super confused because you're like, why do I keep getting hurt every two to three months? And then you actually look back at what you're doing in it and it makes sense. Yeah, Dan John's got a similar message too with this idea of easy strength where it's just kind of like we're not going to make facial expressions. We're not going to grunt. We're, it's, this is not a, a Gatorade commercial. Yep. <laughs> this is consistent, intelligent work over a period of time. And believe me, that pays off. And it doesn't pay off if you go really hard three days in a row. And then the fourth day, you're like, whoo, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so funny. I was literally finishing my workout the other day and I was grunting it out and I'm like, ah, dang it, Dan would be mad at me. <laughs> but I I do find, I mean, like we said, I'm guilty of it. As we had mentioned in this modern world where we're so busy, we have limited time for so many things and we want to try to maximize and get the most in. So I think it's super important to just understand that that might be part of your goal. Just like you said, it's, it depends on what you're interested in. It depends on what your goals are. We're playing the long game here. The majority of should be playing the long game. Some people want the short-term gains as most as, as, as we see, but understanding that the majority of us are doing general prepared fitness training. We're looking to get better at multiple things for the long term. Yeah. Well, interesting what you said about the not having that much time. I, I think what, when you, if you look at some of the research and the benefits of short, intense workouts, it's kind of surprising how much results you get from, you know, spending like five minutes doing something. Uh, but what people want to do is take that intensity and make it 20 or 30 minutes because really? <laughs> it's hard to appreciate, really. I mean, if you, if you, I mean, sometimes I've got a spin bike at home, you know, that where you do this as well as and so, you know, occasionally I'll remember that, you know what, I can get a pretty, I didn't have time to work out today. If I just go for like two minutes all out on that, that's not bad. It's, it's funny <laughs> now you had mentioned that because that same conversation we had on the breath, the, the podcast about the breath is my go-to right now, just with the three kids at home is kettlebell snatch tests. So I go home and I just do kettlebell snatches for five minutes and I try to accumulate a hundred reps. And after that, I'm I'm like sweet I'm good I don't need to do anything else. Yeah, you'll know you'll know it's a it, it's a workout by the way you feel like four or five hours later you're kind of like I can kind of still feel that you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me. Uh, so while I'm kind of just shifting through these last few questions, do you have any recent discoveries or things that you're experimenting on yourself currently? I know you like I know you said you like to kind of bounce around based on your interest. What what are what are some of the things you're experimenting with right now? I'm kind of playing around with stuff I can do at my home that requires uh, very little equipment and is based on kind of really primal, natural movements. So I, I've, I'm doing some, um, a lot of kind of jump stuff. And, it's, and I'm trying to make it kind of like more fun and playful where I'm just kind of looking for targets to jump to kind of like if I'm outside playing with my kids, I'm like, oh, there's a tree overhead. I'm going to try to jump to that leaf. I'm going to try to jump to that leaf. I'm going to try and get it with my left hand. I'm going to try and get my right hand, try to get one straight above me, try to get one that's further away. I run up to this one. And this one is a standing jump or I see how many steps I could jump up my, um, my, my, my front porch stairs. And after about like, you know, five or 10 minutes of what feels like just goofing around, 
I'm like, yeah, I got in a good variety of movement. That's not a bad workout. Now I'm not yeah. done for the day, but it's part of, um, it's something I do during the day, which doesn't even feel like a workout, but is, is actually pretty good for you. Yeah. I've, uh, I love, I love that. And I think that's so funny because as you were talking about that, I literally just flashed back to my childhood and, and all the things you used to do as a kid. And, and, you know, we both have kids, so we see that a little bit more prevalent right now, but I have a four-year-old and that's literally what he's trying to do. Like on our walks, he's trying to catch bugs and he's trying to jump up and grab seed pods or leaves. And, after the walk, you see him and he's like almost exhausted because he did 10 times more than we did just walking around. Yeah. 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 Those kids don't waste a minute. You know that they really don't. They really <laughs> don't. Well, um, Todd, I really appreciate your time. What I, what I want to try to do at the end of each podcast is kind of drop some sort of challenge or encourage people to implement something uh, for the next week after they hear this podcast. And I'll give you kind of a minute to think about that as I, as I chat a little bit more, so I don't just drop it on you like that. But, uh, we want to be able to try to instill some sort of habit or something that someone finds encouraging that they're maybe not doing that they can just explore movement with. So for instance, in the previous, in previous episodes, we talk about breathing, right? How can you start being more mindful of your breath, your breath and what you're doing? What do you, what would be something you would like to encourage our listeners to play with or explore with, with their movement over the next week? Yeah, just what I was just talking about is kind of an example. You could see, uh, see how hard it is to touch a certain leaf and then see how far away from it you can be and still touch it with a running jump. That's not for everyone, of course. Another th- another thing uh, that I occasionally do with the kids or I do with myself is see how fast you can run around the block. You know, what's, what's your best time for running around the block? We think a lot in terms of, you know, what's my broad jump or what's my mile time. But if you kind of contextualize this to, 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 to things that are around you, I think that the idea of doing those things jumps in your mind a little bit more. And it's, it's a little bit more meaningful in a kind of way. I mean, this is the way kids would do stuff. Kids don't say let's have a, let's have a hundred yard dash. They say, let's race to that tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. That. So, I mean, just kind of like thinking of your world as a gym or a place to move is one of the advantages of, of those things. I love it. I love it. So this is uh, what I love about both of those two is they're outside, right? We're going to get outside. We're going to do a little target practice with your jumping. And then we're going to start playing with different running distances over this next week. Pick up, pick a distance in your neighborhood, short or long, and test yourself. And then over the next, uh, which is great because you can do it at the beginning of the week, play around with some additional things. And then hopefully in a week or weeks in the, in the future, you can test and see how you've improved. Todd, I want to thank you for uh, joining me today. It's been a real honor and pleasure chatting with you. As I said before, your work has greatly shaped the way that I view and approach movement in my office. So um, from an extended thanks for my patience, uh, we really appreciate everything that you're doing. And for our listeners, be sure to check Todd's blog out. Again, this is bettermovement.org. So much good resources out there. And I know Todd talks a lot to other coaches and clinicians and teaches, but his work is very, um, it's very succinct where anyone can read it and really apply what he's talking about to your own life. And you'll, you'll instantaneously catch on and, and understand what you're feeling as you read his work. So anything you want to add before we head out? I just thank you very much for the nice, kind words and and your time. Awesome. Well, thanks again, and we'll connect soon. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. Thanks again for joining us on Episode 3 of the Movement Code Podcast with Todd Hargrove. Challenge this week is to get outside, start playing with movement. Find a tree branch, a leaf, something a little bit out of your reach, and start jumping. Try to challenge yourself in different ways we have not been doing for a while. Go around the block, time yourself, sprinting long distance. Get outside, start playing around with movement a little bit more, and exploring your capabilities so that you can learn a little bit more about your body. Thanks for tuning in with us today, and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode.